Military Academy, Belgium. We are waiting for him. Just a few. Ah, sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry, Joan. Yes, ready. Thank you. The floor is for you. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, my presentation will be about uh, a ballistics laboratory um, where we have uh, quite de some developments in uh, metrology. So, um, I'm uh, head of the department, Weapon Systems and Ballistics of the Royal Military Academy. In my department, I have some uh, 25 collaborators, of which elf researchers and nine, nine lab uh, technicians. And in my presentation, I will uh, explain the mission of the lab, uh, show which basic measurement techniques we, we, we use, and then uh, show some uh, recent uh, highlights. So the Royal Military Academy is a university, so we have master students, we have uh, PhD students, and this means that we are active in the three pillars of the university, so academics. In the lab, we uh, teach uh, practical work with the, with the students, and also um, our PhD students are active in the lab. We do a lot of research, and we um, offer our expertise to uh, third parties like uh, government and, uh, and industry. The, the time is almost distributed evenly between the three um, Our clients are in the first place, of course, uh, defense with our students, but also technical work for defense. Uh, also the police forces in, in, in Belgium and in other countries. Uh, Justice Department, we have a forensics lab, so we have two uh, ballistic experts who are working with the Justice Department. And we do a lot of uh, work with the industry. Uh, the work with industry funds is quite important but it, because it allows us to have some uh, supplementary budget to invest into um, lab equipment. Well, we work, of course, on weapons. It's about ballistics. But ballistics is more than just weapons. We also look into other applications. And so basically, we are interested in all objects that fly and don't have wings. So, for instance, uh, we work on a bird strike. So we have a bird strike simulator which we use for um, industry. Uh, we also work uh, with other scientists like uh, archaeologists. We have done work on uh, uh, sling stones, medieval and Roman uh, sling stones, in order to, to study the ballistics of uh, these uh, objects. Our lab is uh, limited to small caliber. Uh, for the main reason, actually, we are inside the academy, uh, very close to the European Commission in the center of Brussels. So this means that the high caliber uh, investigations is not possible. And so we're limited to um, uh, 0.50, so 12.7 uh, 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 caliber. So uh, we, are, we have uh, six main research activities. The first one is not really, a, let's say, uh, experimental oriented. It's about survivability and risk assessment. So this means that we, with models, we evaluate uh, hit probability, skill probability, survivability uh, of, of, of weapons, of systems. Uh, and this is basically on the on computer that we do this kind of uh, uh, analysis. Then we are active in the three, let's say, pillars of ballistics. Interior ballistics, what happens in the gun. Exterior ballistics, what happens during the flight of the projectile. And this includes for us intermediate ballistics. So this is a part uh, where the, the, the projectile leaves the barrel and where there is a lot of interaction between the gas coming from the muzzle and uh, the projectile. And then we have, of course, the terminal ballistics. The, the main focus of the lab for the moment is still on the uh, terminal ballistics, so typically per personal protection, helmets, vests, but also protection of vehicles and, and structures against um, uh, bullet impacts. Then we have two more specific applications. Um, we have a group working on human body response. So it's about wound ballistics, uh, a specific part of uh, terminal ballistics. So interaction with, the bullet, with bullets and uh, the human body, and also with uh, non-lethal weapons. So a non-lethal weapon has as objective to incapacitate an aggressor, but without inflicting damage. So the problem here is that you need to balance very um, precisely the energy 
you, 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 you put into a, a human body. And therefore, we develop specific um, equipment and tests in order to evaluate the, the effects of these kind of uh, projectiles. And a consequence of this is that we develop also activity in the counter UAV uh, department. Um, the UAVs we consider are the LSS, so the low flying, small, slow UAVs. Uh, so the small drones that we can buy in, in, in the shop. Um, and the problem here is that they are easily accessible and can be used, for instance, um, uh, to, to, to organize small attacks in a city like Brussels. So it has happened before. Uh, Angela Merkel at a certain moment uh, was threatened by a small drone. And the problem for Defense Force is, defense force is how to, to, to neutralize a drone like this. Well, you could use a typical air defense weapon, but in a situation like uh, the European Commission, you cannot deploy such weapons. And therefore, we are looking for the use of non-lethal weapons to kill and to neutralize uh, UAVs. So it's a quite specific application of uh, counter UAV and non-lethal weapons. So this is the mission of the lab, and of course, no mission without a vision. Um, it, it's not easy to, uh, to let's say, to, to to maintain a lab like this, we have many um, sister facilities in industry and also in government who are closing down their labs because a lab like this costs quite a lot of money. You need highly qualified personnel and quite expensive equipment. Um, we are trying to keep our facilities intact and even increase our capacity. Uh, and so lab testing is quite important also in the field of ballistics. And okay, it's shown on the slide. Ballistics is a science. Uh, science means knowledge, and for knowledge you need to measure and you need to test. And so numerical simulations are a solution, but they cannot always, re or, well, they will never replace the, the test in the lab. So in our department, we try to balance both. So both are complementary, but we see that the shift is going towards numerical simulations and lab testing is, is let's say, becoming problematic. So this is, of course, a, a threat. And to see that the threat is real, also in my department, I uh, reproduce here the communication between a lab technician and a researcher. The, researchers, the researcher says, oh no, the lab technician says, well, we measured a certain value and it is one. The researcher says, well, my, my simulation showed it is two. Uh, well, we measured one. And reply of the researcher, so we should redo the measurements urgently. Uh, of course, this is not correct. It's the other way around. So you see, it's, it's not that easy even for our researchers to maintain the correct focus and to start with experiments and then only to uh, validate numerical simulations. So we have some uh, parameters which are quite important for us that we need to, to measure. And I will give you an overview of some measurement techniques. The first one is velocity. Uh, velocity is important for us for the interior ballistics to validate the, um, our interior ballistics models, we need to have a velocity not only at the muzzle, but also in bore. So we have radars which are capable of, and I don't know if I can show this. Um, yeah, so here we have a radar looking into the barrel, which allows us to have a velocity curve during the acceleration of the projectile. And of course, the typical uh, measurement is in flight to have a, a full, let's say, um, a velocity curve until impact. I didn't mention it, but we have a tunnel of 100 meters. So this, is, gives us, this gives us some distance in order to evaluate, for instance, drag coefficients on a projectile. We also use other instruments to measure um, velocity. So the most basic solution, of course, is a barrier. So we have a distance. We measure twice the passage time of the projectile. So we have the velocity at the center at, of the barrier. This is, let's say, always used during uh, every shot. Uh, but to have some more information, we typically use uh, high-speed cameras, which give also some visual uh, additional uh, data. So we specialize in this. We try to optimize these, uh, these instruments. And so high-speed imaging is basically our, our, our main sensor. Uh, we use it for velocity measurement, but also for to visualize um, our, our developments. So we we accelerate typical bullets, but also other um, objects, 
and therefore we need uh, to fit the projectile into a barrel and so we have to design sabots and the complication with sabots is that you have to make sure that there's no perturbation in the launch of the projectile and therefore we need um, visual information to make sure that everything works um, as foreseen. Our latest acquisition, acquisition is in a high-speed infrared uh, camera. Uh, we just finished uh, our first preliminary project to, to learn the instrument. And the object here was to measure the bullet temperature in flight. Uh, well, you could ask yourself, why do you do this? Uh, well, there was a practical question by defense uh, uh, headquarters. We had at a certain moment a fire in a firing range. Um, and one of the generals thought, well, it could have been the temperature of the bullets. We couldn't say which temperature a bullet has in flight. So this was a nice uh, project to test for the first time or sensor. And it's not hot enough to uh, set fire to a... Uh, in, in nature. Then uh, a last uh, application of high-speed imaging is uh, Schlieren and shadow photography. Uh, I will not detail it in, uh, uh, now because there will be a workshop tomorrow by uh, my colleague Mr. Moomen uh, who will explain his work on uh, shadow photography in the field of uh, missile flow and interior, intermediate um, ballistics. Uh, Another measurement quite important for us is pressure. Uh, pressure in the barrel during uh, the acceleration of the projectile. Uh, there are different reasons to measure pressure, of course, again, to validate models for interior ballistic, but also for safety. So we develop our own powder mixtures and, and bullets and so on. And we have to make sure that we don't go too high in pressure and that we have an explosion of uh, the, the barrel. So a typical measurement of pressure is by drilling a hole in the casing, and then with the piezo center, you have a direct measurement. But this is quite fast. This can create complications. It's not that easy to well apply um, the sensor. And therefore, we have a project for the moment going on, uh, looking into other ways of um, uh, measuring pressure. And so what we see here is a non-conformal uh, pressure sensor. So it, it measures the pressure on the casing of the project, of the on the casing of the, yeah, the projectile, so without drilling. Um, and so for the moment, we are evaluating the, the, the method in order to see if it is uh, as good as the previous uh, method and even better in the sense of uh, usability. Um, another project going on for the moment is the effect of wear of a gun on its performance. Uh, so that's in the field of um, interior ballistics where we're using a coordinate measuring machine, machine, so a CMM. So you see it here on the left. And it, it is a system that has sensors, which are quite precise, and they allow to measure the geometry inside, in our uh, case, the barrel. The precision of our system is 0.7 micrometers. So it's really fine. And it allows us to see how the, the, the barrel uh, wears as a function of the number of shots. So we are firing thousands and thousands of shots with a barrel, and after each thousands of uh, each series of thousand shots, we measure the wear, we measure pressure, and so we have an idea about the influence of the wear on the performance of the gun. Uh, in the field of exterior ballistics, um, we are in the process of acquiring uh, a wind tunnel, a supersonic wind tunnel. So we just finished finish the project on the use of CFD to determine the ballistic coefficients of uh, small caliber projectiles. And now we are uh, setting up a test facility to validate these, these models. So for the moment, we have very nice results uh, on the computer, but validated with other methods. And the idea of having a wind tunnel is to be able to design other types of uh, projectiles, like supercavitating bullets, counter UAV ammunition, and smart bullets, so guided ammunition and the small caliber um, range. Uh, another highlight uh, of the last year is um, uh, an exercise we had in Sardinia, in, a, in Italy, uh, within NATO. So we had the lead of an exercise with industry in the counter UEV uh, range, so the small drones, where different technologies uh, proposed by industry were, were evaluated. Uh, we had some uh, laser uh, applications. Uh, we had the typical, uh, let's say, um, um, kinetic uh, energy bullets. We had uh, systems using nets 
uh, with the rifle or on, on drones, so for capturing uh, uh, drones. And the conclusion of the exercise is, well, industry still has some work to do. Uh, it's promising, but it's not, uh, let's say, uh, operational or far from operational yet for the moment. Uh, and to conclude, uh, something quite specific, we were also involved as one of the teams in the investigation of the MH17. So my, my special, specialty is uh, guided weapons. And so we were asked by uh, the joint investigation team to evaluate, uh, well, what happened actually. And so there are two questions. Uh, how was the aircraft shot down? So MH17 is a Malaysian aircraft that was shot down in 2014 above Ukraine. Uh, well, the first, well, this question was quite simple. It was a Russian book. Uh, the second question was, well, where was the missile launched? And so we had to determine the launch position of the missile. This was a bit more complicated. Uh, so here you have pictures uh, of the, the aircraft on the launch site. And we were implied in the, ex in the investigation from the moment that the, uh, the wreckage arrived in the Netherlands, where we helped in uh, the triage of the, the, the wreckage. And basically we were looking for pieces of, of missiles. And indeed we did find uh, pieces of uh, a book uh, missile. So a book missile has a quite specific uh, warhead, as you see here. And basically, in order to calculate trajectories, we had to know much better uh, the, the, the warhead. Uh, and so basically, in order to determine the trajectory of the, the missile, we started from the airplane. So the wreckage was, oh, this is a bit too fast. The wreckage was recomposed in the Netherlands with the pieces that were brought back. And basically, we did a typical forensic investigation. So we had uh, holes generated by the fragments of the warhead. We applied some stringing. So the strings here represent the trajectory of the fragments, which allowed us, allows us to have an idea about the position of the warhead at the moment of explosion, which allowed us to have, uh, let's say, a computer model of the impact of the fragments and their trajectories. So this gave the position of the warhead at the moment of explosion. Next thing we needed to know was the attitude of the missile, the, the angles with respect to the aircraft, and then we could calculate back towards the launch position. Therefore, we had the opportunity to go to Ukraine, and we, we got us some books, and we had the opportunity to have an arena test on two, uh, two warheads in Ukraine. And here you see uh, an, an uh, overview of the, the, the arena test, so the missile but with its forehead is at the center here. And then we have witness plates around, like you see here in the side view, uh, witness plates and the material of which the aircraft was made. And then of course, this allowed us, allowed us to have a measurement about the fragmentation of the warhead. So the idea of this kind of test is to characterize the warhead, which is absolutely not symmetric. So it's something like a fingerprint. It's quite unique for, for each type of, uh, of warhead. Well, the video is not working. But uh, I can show a, a result. So the plates were, after the explosion, were brought back to the Netherlands. And then you can evaluate all the, the, the perforations with, by the fragments. And this allows you, for instance, to have a count of fragments as a function of the ejection angle. So with respect to the axis of the warhead. So it's really a characteristic of the warhead. This gave us uh, an idea of the fragmentation of the warhead. We have the fragmentation of the aircraft and by, then by a mathematical correlation, we were able to see how the warhead was oriented at the moment of the explosion. And then we could calculate back with the trajectory model of the book towards the launch position. So our model gave us position uh, one, uh, Royal Military Academy. Another position was calculated by TNO, but they did their work on uh, preliminary data, so they did not have the same data we had, but let's say the, the correlation is quite good, so there's not that much difference between our two sets of uh, uh, solution. Uh, a quite different solution was proposed by the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, but you can already see that this kind of position is not that good because all the damage is on the left side of the aircraft and not on the front and, and, and the right. Um, and on the seam, on the, the slide of the picture here, you can see why the Russians came with a, a quite different uh, solution. So basically, with this trajectory model, we came to a likelihood function, which gave us the most probable position of the launcher at the moment of, um, well, the launch of the, bo the book missile. So 
the aircraft was hit here in this location, and we came to positions somewhere here. This is territory occupied by Russia, so it's Ukraine, but occupied by Russia in 2014. The launch position proposed by the Russians was here, and this was in territory not occupied by, by Russia at, in, in 2014. Um, the positions, the other positions here are positions proposed by other tactical teams, so we had different teams working in parallel, and the four most probable solutions are here, and these um, uh, um, correspond quite well to our calculations. So this ends my presentation. Um, so I'm uh, welcome. I'm welcoming your your questions and thank you for your attention, Mr. President. Thank you, John. Very glad. <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm very happy that uh, your presentation has been included in the International Military Panel, and uh, I don't know if someone else uh, already know or heard. Uh, the, the, the item that uh, already presented by Joan. For me, it's, uh, it's the first time uh, I got an opportunity yesterday night to discuss uh, of your presentation with uh, Professor Tellini. And I know that uh, you were in contact in, in the past and working on this project. Uh, maybe someone, uh, please, yes. Um, I, I don't have the figures. Uh, both are accurate enough for us. Um, basically, we prefer the high-speed camera if it's about precision, but you only have a limited field of view, but it gives you the most, um, most reliable and, and most precise information. Uh, on the other hand, the radar uh, is very useful because you have information on a long part of the trajectory, but it doesn't contain that much details. But we are working on, on um, uh, improving the, the knowledge of our radar system to extract more information, for instance, about rotation speed of the projectile, for, the, for instance, and also the attitude. But for the moment, we are not there yet, but that's one of the, the, the projects we are having. But the, the, the one we are used most is basically high speed. We, we master it at best. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Joan. Then, thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Lieutenant Cellamare from uh, Centro Italiano Studi uh, Mil uh, Militari. Is a he will speaks around the spectral remote sensing and super resolution. So, uh, good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant uh, Gianluca Celamare. I work in uh, the Electroptics Office in CISA here in, Pias, in Pisa, and I'm going to present our works about upper spectral remote sensing and uh, super resolution. Uh, um, first of all, I wanted to, uh, to thank the organizer for uh, let, uh, letting us to, uh, attend this, uh, attend this uh, workshop. So, uh, here we can see the outlook of this presentation. I will start with uh, a brief introduction of the of this um, theoretical uh, theoretical introduction, and then I will show some results uh, that uh, CISAM um, carried out during uh, uh, its campaigns uh, about hyperspectral remote sensing and uh, super resolution, and then uh, we conclude with uh, some uh, future development. So, if we have a normal 2D space, uh, 2D image, we have an image in, uh, in space. If we add uh, more image, image of the same uh, scenario uh, at different uh, angles, we can obtain a 2D, a 3D uh, image. If we, this isn't uh, the only way to obtain a 3D image. If we add uh, spectral information, we can obtain a, the, the a hypercube, so a cube of image with uh, each image um, acquired by an hyperspectral sensor with different um, uh, wavelength range. 
uh, if we acquired in different times uh, the, some image of the same uh, area, uh, we could uh, uh, combine in them to obtain a, 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 an image with an high resolution. Uh, with an high resolution. This technique is called uh, super resolution. So, uh, talking about the hyperspectral technology, uh, the research about it started uh, about at the, uh, the beginning of the 2000 uh, with different uh, projects, especially PNRM projects, and with the different uh, groups, EDA, both EDA and uh, NATO groups. Uh, the research about uh, the perspectral research uh, consists on uh, the implementation uh, of software and uh, hardware both. When we talk about the hyperspectral, we consider only a, a part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, uh, especially th this part consists in uh, the visible, uh, near uh, infrared and uh, red uh, and uh, infrared uh, range. So we, we are also, uh, we are both in the reflective and uh, thermal domains. Um, as I said before, we have implemented, studied and tested uh, different types of uh, algorithms. Uh, for, for example, classification, detection, recognition, and uh, target relocation algorithms. Uh, one of them could be applied uh, directly uh, on a raw image. Uh, other ones, we need a pre-processing. So, I will start with uh, show some results um, that uh, uh, CISAM obtained uh, during some activities in the last years. We are in an EDA group called DUCAS in Belgium in 2011, and we tested a, an anomaly detection algorithm um, um, on uh, uh, images that were acquired by um, do reflective domain uh, sensor. So uh, we tested before uh, the, the, our algorithm on a sensor called Simga, and uh, how we can see maybe <laughs> on the image, uh, there is a ship. If we apply our uh, algorithm, we can see that uh, there are two, uh, two smaller ships that we, there are uh, not visible um, to the naked eye. Uh, if we apply uh, the same algorithm on uh, on another image that was acquired by another hyperspectral sensor called uh, ISPEX, we can obtain, uh, we have obtained the same uh, results, so we, we, can, we can say that we obtain very good uh, results. So, uh, uh, CISAM um, carried out also a campaign in 2013 in Viareggio, uh, near Pisa, with the cooperation of the University of Pisa, uh, CNR and uh, uh, Leonardo Company. And in this uh, case, we tested uh, um, our algorithms on uh, both on C and uh, urban scenarios. So uh, we started to uh, test the uh, possibility to use this uh, kind of technology in a, in a search and rescue activity. So we uh, simulated a SR event uh, with the help of the, um, uh, the, um, the Italian Navy Rossetti um, that uh, uh, pulled some objects like uh, sweets or little boat. Uh, or a boy or a life boy uh, to simulate a SAR event. So if we, um, we, how we can see by the slide, uh, we can see um, the, all the objects that were pulled by the, boat, by the ship uh, from the, uh, the image that was acquired by um, the hyperspectral sensor. But uh, if we apply our, uh, after we applied our, our um, uh, algorithm, we can see that all the objects uh, pulled by the ship uh, were detected. So we, we can see that uh, the hyperspectral te technology uh, could be uh, a, a very good uh, trade-off uh, in terms of resolution, uh, detection capability, and time processing to identify ship record or uh, uh, man-made object in uh, open water. And we see that uh, if uh, we use this technology uh, in uh, SR activity uh, with, the, uh, with the implementation of a anomaly detection algorithm, uh, we can observe it and uh, process it in real time uh, to detect the uh, main, main object uh, in the upper water, an area of about 100 km square per hour. 
and um, we can also use this kind of uh, technology technology in a pollution reveal activity uh, in this case we need a classification algorithm and uh, we can automatically observe it and uh, process it um, to detect pollution an area of about 180 kilometers square uh, per hour uh, after the C scenario, we also um, tested our algorithm and uh, performance of this technology in a urban scenario. Uh, and especially we tested anomaly uh, change detection and recognition uh, algorithms. Um, in this case, we have some problems because uh, the urban environment is uh, more complex, uh, is a, a more complex scenario than the open water uh, scenario. So uh, what can we consider an anomaly in the urban scenario? And we tested uh, at the first time this uh, algorithm in, uh, in Belgium with the EDA, EDA groups and uh, we choose an area and uh, we, um, uh, we were looking for a, a tank in that uh, image. So we have acquired our, uh, our image and we, uh, apply, we, ap we have applied our um, algorithm and we can see that there are a lot of uh, detected anomalies. Um, uh, we um, apply the threshold to, uh, um, uh, to delete all the anomalies that are that event a size in terms of pixel um, similar to a, a tank. So we uh, now we have a few uh, detected anomalies, but which of them is uh, our uh, target of interest, so our uh, tank. So uh, now we, sorry. So the, uh, uh, a slide, I don't know why, it's, why it's, I'm sorry, this is a problem with the slide. Um, but, uh, 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 um, we, uh, in this slide that you can see, <laughs> Um, we uh, we um, we uh, we say that uh, I, I'm going to, to say that we need the human participation because uh, in this case uh, the operator has to uh, um, control each anomalies in uh, in the uh, in the image so it's detecting anomalies to control uh, which of them is our um, our target of interest um, because it is impossible in a urban scenario that is more complex understand which of, which of anomaly uh, detect anomalies is uh, our target of interest and then i have tested also uh, during uh, in uh, the eda work group uh, uh, ducas a change detection uh, an, um, algorithm that was implemented uh, that was implemented and uh, uh, in this case we have a, we uh, add two acquisition by the by our sensor uh, at two different time and uh, we focus on an area a parking area and we can see there are some uh, differences that are uh, uh, carded uh, moved and so if we uh, apply our change detection algorithm we can see that uh, it automatically reveals some difference, and so we uh, had uh, very good uh, uh, results. Uh, then we also uh, have uh, tested a target relocation algorithm, so we have acquired, we um, uh, add the first acquisition by the sensor, we choose uh, our target of interest, it, it is a, a, a gray car, and we acquired also the is uh, spectral uh, signature. The aim is to uh, found it uh, in another acquisition. So we have tested before a car detection algorithm and, and then a, a change detection algorithm, but in, in both cases we have uh, detected, uh, detected a lot of uh, um, anomalies uh, and so we had uh, uh, not good uh, results. So we, but if we combine uh, these uh, algorithms, uh, we um, can see that uh, we obtain our target relocation algorithm and we can see that there are uh, a, a low number of, uh, of uh, ano detected anomalies, one of them is our target of interest. And uh, if uh, we uh, see um, uh, with uh, the other uh, detected anomalies, we can see that are um, 
object very similar to our target of interest. So we can see that also in this case, we had, we had uh, good results. So uh, um, now I'm talking about the, um, uh, the tests that we have done also with the sensor in the thermal domain. And um, it, is, uh, it, is, it, it was the SITGA, it is made by uh, Leonardo. And uh, we, we were in, uh, uh, with the EDA uh, group, work group in, uh, in 2011 in Belgium. And so we, we had uh, acquired the same area um, that, that we have seen uh, in, uh, the slide, on the slide before. And uh, you can see that if we apply our uh, anomaly detection algorithm, we obtain uh, uh, good, uh, uh, good results. So we can detect all the three ships that are present in, uh, um, in the picture. Um, it's important to focus on uh, the fact that uh, with the thermal domain uh, sensor, we could uh, um, acquire image also in, uh, uh, during the night and not only during, uh, during the day. It is a very important uh, difference. So concluding my first uh, uh, argument with the life spectral uh, introduction, uh, I, um, um, we can see that uh, we have uh, implemented, studied and tested classification, detection and recognition algorithms that are nowadays uh, eff efficient and reliable. And uh, we also obtain some real time classification and detection algorithms that, that are implemented uh, on board. Uh, for the thermal domain, we haven't uh, uh, real time uh, processing uh, yet, and we, are, we have more complexity for, uh, for the algorithms because before the data processing, uh, it is often necessary to separate the temperature and emissivity data by uh, the image. And uh, the spectral and spatial resolution uh, are lower than the reflective domain because, uh, uh, because of the lower radiation, so the lower signal to noise uh, uh, ratio that is coming back from the scene. So now I'm going to, to show uh, another technique that uh, uh, we have studied in, uh, in CISAM, and it is called the super resolution. If we have uh, some uh, um, uh, low uh, resolution image uh, of uh, an area of a scenario, we could combine them um, to improve the, the quality and the resolution of this, uh, this image. This uh, technique is called uh, super resolution. And an example could be uh, uh, more frames of the same uh, video. And uh, we can see an example of the application of an algorithm of uh, super resolution with where we, can, we have improved the quality of, uh, of the, the image. So how it is it possible? Uh, each uh, image is characterized by a sub-pixel um, shift uh, due to uh, the movement of the sensor of uh, the object in, uh, in the picture, in the image. And so if we can uh, calculate it, we can use it to reconstruct an high resolution uh, image from some low resolution image. It is possible because we consider the image as a grid, a, a low resolution grid, and we can reconstruct the highest resolution uh, image um, creating the, uh, a, an high resolution grid. It is possible only uh, if we can uh, evaluate and calculate the sub pixel shift between the, the low, re low uh, resolution image. Um, what we have seen in the slide before is uh, the ideal uh, uh, event. So we, uh, we can uh, reconstruct uh, uh, in a fully way our high resolution image, but uh, could be possible that uh, we haven't enough image or enough uh, data to reconstruct full the high resolution image. It could have some holes that should be uh, filled with some other methods or some methods that we have to choose in a good way. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, uh, application, this technique is very important. Uh, the number of the low resolution image that we are uh, to, um, that we are acquired and we are to uh, uh, interpolate to obtain the high resolution image because is uh, uh, the number of the image, the low resolution, uh, the low resolution image are uh, not enough. We could have. Uh, uh, we couldn't have bad, uh, good results to reconstruct the, hazard, the high resolution image. Uh, but uh, if we have uh, too much image, uh, we could have some ambiguity 
uh, and so we could have also uh, bad results in the reconstruction of the high resolution uh, image. So here we can see a recap of, uh, of this technique, um, of the steps that, that uh, made uh, this, uh, uh, this technique. At this time, we have to uh, choose and to acquire our low resolution uh, image. Then we have to choose a common area in the, in the image where we want to apply uh, our uh, um, um, our algorithm. Then we have to uh, choose the best method to evaluate the subpixel shift, um, and that was implemented. That will be implemented on the, the image. Um, we have so to um, uh, apply our super-resolution method algorithm to uh, create uh, the high-resolution grid to reconstruct the image. And uh, if uh, it is necessary, we have to. Uh, choose the best uh, interpolation method to fill eventual uh, holes remaining in, uh, in, uh, in our grid. And uh, then, if it is necessary, we could uh, apply some other uh, algorithms to uh, improve the quality of the, the image, for example, to remove blurring of, uh, or, or noising. Now I'm going to show uh, two examples to understand how this technique uh, uh, works. And we have a, a, a picture of, a, of a, a, a ship. If we acquire our, um, our super resolution algorithm, we can see that we have improved uh, its uh, quality. For example, we can see uh, the, we can read the name of the brand of this ship, it's Calvo, maybe. And uh, then we, we could also apply some other um, methods to improve the quality of the image. For example, zoom and contrast uh, adjustment, we can obtain also uh, better, uh, a better image. We have also applied uh, this the sub resolution algorithm on a urban scenario image. Uh, on the left, we have uh, a, a low resolution image. On the, on the right, we have a high resolution image. At the same Im uh, image after the application of our algorithm, and uh, the aim, uh, our aim in this case is to read the, um, the word stop that is in the upper part of the of the picture. Uh, it is enough uh, possible, but we can see that we have improved the quality, especially focus on the the stripes that are painted uh, in the parking area in the lower uh, part of the of the image. So, uh, concluding the, this uh, argument, the super resolution uh, um, introduction, we, we can, a lot of methods have been studied and verified in order to uh, evaluate shift, especially sub pixel shift, interpret reconstructed image, enhance super resolution uh, image quality, and estimate maximum super resolution factor. Uh, it's important to, to say that uh, it isn't uh, a best technique, best algorithm or best method uh, for a super resolution, but uh, uh, each image uh, need a different uh, algorithm and, uh, um, and has a, a best uh, algori uh, super resolution algorithm. At the moment, it's, uh, uh, we haven't uh, yet uh, an objective measurement uh, uh, um, uh, quality uh, results, and uh, we haven't yet a, a, a time, real-time application of these uh, techniques. So I will conclude my presentation with some uh, future development, and we haven't uh, uh, applied our applicate our uh, um, algorithms on satellite-based hyperspectral image yet, and we are going we uh, we. we we aim to do it uh, in, in the future. Um, we, uh, we haven't yet a thermal domain perspectral uh, um, uh, image uh, uh, real-time uh, processing, and it could be very interesting, uh, a fusion between different sensor images, for example, image uh, that are acquired by panchromatic uh, uh, sensor or synthetic aperture radar, and uh, it could be very interesting also the integration between the technique that I have presented uh, at, uh, today, uh, hyperspectral and sub-resolution. For your attention, I'm here for some uh, questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Celamara. I, I usually work uh, with an uh, aerial works company,
and we use a thermal uh, sensor and sometimes also hyperspectral sensors. The main problem when we use uh, an hyperspectral sensor is that to get the right algorithm to find the solution for the company that uh, commit uh, the, the works. In this case, I have two questions for you. Is if, if you have developed the hyperspectral sensors or is a commercial hyperspectral? And uh, another question is related to the, how to you detect the pollution. You told us that uh, you have uh, developed a sort of a classification of the algorithm. Can you say something else? Yes, um, we at the moment, uh, la, the Italian Navy hasn't uh, developed um, a, uh, some uh, sensors, but we um, have worked with the um, Leonardo company to uh, with the, 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 the and University of Pisa and uh, and the CNR um, with some uh, prototypes and uh, we have used for example Singa or Sitga that were uh, financed by in PNRM projects and so we have used them but we we know that for example Leonardo uh, um, Leonardo company has some uh, uh, prototypes and commercial uh, prototype of this kind of uh, sensors, and uh, for the um, and for the second uh, uh, question, how you develop a sort of classification for the yes uh, how to detect pollution? Uh, yes, because which kind of pollution is uh, uh, the classification gas, uh, fuel or. And um, uh, with the classification, uh, uh, we, we tested some uh, classification algorithm with, uh, for example, fuel or some, something, something else. We have uh, tested in a few cases in, uh, at the moment, but we know that we also we have tested also class other classification algorithm that we tested on a, a, a natural, uh, natural uh, scenario um, um, near Casimeno, uh, I don't remember. Where um, and we have tested some also real-time uh, classification algorithm and that are very uh, efficient because uh, we um, can separate the the glass uh, the, uh, the, um, the the water from the, the streets or for, by the, the glass and um, so we we haven't uh, uh, um, so we haven't tested in other kind of uh, um, of scenarios, but we know that uh, it could be also efficient in, uh, in, in that case. Thank you. Any other questions? Pasquale? Thank you, Cellamar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Colonel Galgani. He's a deputy chief uh, space, Air Force space. He will present uh, an update status of uh, Italian Air Force space activities. Yes, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Let me load the briefing. Okay, seems it's working. Sorry, how to move these slides? Yes. Okay, it works. So, as the moderator said, I work in the air staff in Rome, and I'm the vice chief of the space office, general office for space. My chief is General Vittori, you probably know him, who is one of the five uh, Air Force astronauts. Now he's working in Washington for the Artemis program, so the back to the moon, and but he will come back uh, soon in Italy. And uh, today I'm pleased to be here. I thank you the organization to invite uh, us to present uh, which are the main programs of the Air Force in the space and aerospace uh, uh, domain. I will not speak directly on uh, metrics or metrology, but I, as you can imagine, all these programs are really related to and supported by metrology and devices and techniques. This is the agenda. I will uh, make a short introduction on the history, I think, and uh, then I point out which are the challenges that has been identified by the Italian Air Force in these domains, and then I'll uh, brief the main programs that the Italian Air Force is uh, uh, bringing up. I'll just point out uh, one, uh, one thing. 
we can imagine that looking at this slide that uh, in less than a century the technology has taken a huge jump forward just remembering that the first fly machine built by Wilborn and Orrid Wright in 1903 was able to fly only for a few meters and a few minutes at 30 meters high. Then in less than 70 years, on July 1969, Neil Armstrong made his first step in the moon and just a few years later, in April 1981, we got the first mission of the shuttle Columbia. Actually, I will uh, say that the shuttle has been the first example of a reusable vehicle able to reach the space by, by a rocket launch and able to come back to the Earth landing with an airplane, as an airplane. Today, modern space programs are based on, on this important concept. The reusable assets, because is, if the asset is reusable, you can lower the payload launch uh, cost in orbit. I want also to remember uh, Luigi Broglio. Uh, Luigi Broglio was a general of the Italian force. Actually, uh, in his career, he was also a uh, professor to the La Sapienza in Rome. And, uh, but General Broglio is, uh, I mean, is known because uh, he was appointed to guide, the lead the uh, project uh, in, uh, in the 60s to bring uh, Italy to be the third nation to fire a, a, an artificial satellite in space, so the project San Marco. So, for this reason, actually, uh, Luigi Broglio is known as the father of the modern Italian space uh, activities. Let's go ahead and see which are the main challenges that uh, actually, actually, for the Italian force perspective, has been identified for space and aerospace. First of all, speaking about space domain, nowadays it is well known that space is congested by a great number of debris, including inoperative satellites, estimating numbers of 34,000 objects greater than 10 centimeters and 900,000 from 1 to 10 centimeter. Impressive numbers. It's really a safety issue for all operative assets. And we cannot forget the space weather effects on satellites and space services. Furthermore, space is, is a contested environment, also considering that current international laws and regulation needs for some uh, changes and updates. We are back in 1967 about uh, the treaty. In consideration of the technology progress that we got in the last 50 years. Currently, with the Western technology advantages really reduced to a minimum, if we consider the space capabilities reached by nations like Russia and China, or also India, uh, we, we need really to uh, have a look to the rules that need to be updated. And these nations ac actually have the capability to be a threat for our satellites. Space is also a competitive environment. Since in the latest years, an increasing number of private companies have developed many new space systems. Uh, think about uh, SpaceX or uh, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic, uh, Blue Origin. Private competition is certainly a positive factor, but all technological developments must be closely monitored by the air forces, since all space systems can have a dual use, therefore also military capabilities. Now, taking a look at this slide, I want to uh, give you the perspective of the air force. Most, uh, because, uh, as you know, for the Air Force, the prior mission, the first mission, the Air Force is to defend the, the, the skies, the Italian national airspace. 24 day, hours a day, three, three, uh, 365 days a year. And the airspace is going from the air, from the ground to 100, 100 kilometers, so the, about the Kalman line. Over the other space, we know that we don't have sovereignty. So actually, a satellite can overfly our territories without limitation. Uh, so, since uh, uh, a few years ago, we had just uh, to monitor ballistic capabilities, intercontinental ballistic capabilities, but now, today, we have a lot of new assets, new experimental assets, that assets and vehicles that are able, and weapons that are able to operate in the high layer of the atmosphere, also overpassing the Karman line and coming back to the uh, to the Earth. So actually, our we need as an air force to monitor so over the Karman line to protect our territory uh, and to assure our prior prior mission. So.
So let's look at the main programs, Start with, uh, starting with uh, the space situation awareness. As I mentioned before, space is a congested environment. And any space in, space faring nation in order to operate its own satellites and guarantee the safety and security of the, those assets needs to monitor the outer space with appropriate space surveillance system and sensors, radars and optical telescopes. Also, the space weather needs to be monitored since a solar storm could create waves of energy capable not only to disrupt space devices, but also to damage satellites itself. Furthermore, possible satellite maneuvers accomplished by a possible opponent must be monitored. And uh, there is a need to know what kind of capabilities got the satellite of a possible opponent. For instance, uh, uh, is already a few times that uh, Russian satellites are maneuvering to just approach Western satellites, shadowing them just to, with the seeking devices, just to try to spy uh, the assets. We're uh, doing that uh, since years on also our military satellites and uh, uh, Seeker, for instance, and uh, the Athena Fidus, that is a French satellite. So, if we speak about that, the space situation awareness is uh, looking at these problems. Monitor the outer space to know what is all there for safety from debris, for security from uh, other assets, and from say, space weather. So, the Italian force, starting from uh, 2014, has developed a national space situation awareness capability providing cooperation with the national industry and leveraging the academic and university research. As you can see in the slide, a net uh, of sensor, national sensors, has been uh, uh, obtained, including laser, uh, radars, and optical sensors. We made uh, some agreements with, uh, between the Italian Defense, the Italian Force, the Italian Space Agency, and the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics, just making a federation of sensors. But the Italian Force were realizing the software and the net, because it's a military net serving and uh, to, to task the sensors and to receive the results and then to collect, to exploit and to give a product to the uh, users that are the, the defense the, uh, and uh, the, uh, for instance, the uh, easy, the space, uh, space agency and also the civilian population. For instance, last year we monitored the, the, when the Long March uh, missile uh, rocket body was uh, dropping down of the sky, re-entering the atmosphere. I will see later on a slide on that. And as I mentioned before, this is the example. Uh, during the 19th of May, this rocket body so was a, a rocket that used the, the Chinese to put a one module of the international in the Chinese space station. That module was actually a cylinder of a tungsten of uh, very uh, metal, 10 meters uh, long and uh, two meters uh, wide, that was oriented in the atmosphere. So we estimated that being so huge, uh, most probably will not be consuming re-entry in the atmosphere. So our national center that is based in Pochorenatico were activated by the civil protection to monitor these, the uh, passages over Italy highlighting which areas could be uh, on danger for uh, the uh, re-entry of this object. And we try to calculate also the re-entry point. It's not so simple because the object is uh, over flying at 28,000 km per hour, so 7 km per second. And you can see on the right also uh, with our thermal camera in, uh, in, in Perda Sefoku, we are, were able to make a shot of uh, the object over flying. And later on, uh, we see also a presentation about the sensors that we are using in, in uh, Perdas de Fogo. So, changing the argument. This is okay, the system got stuck. Okay, let's go to the suborbital flight. The Italian Force made an agreement with the National Research Council to fly a mission on board of Spaceship 2, the suborbital vehicle designed by Virgin Galactic. The mission actually planned in autumn, is planned in 2022 and will be accomplished by two Italian officers, one engineer and one flight surgeon, and one researcher of the CNR, 
and the Italian team will uh, perform 12 experiments in microgravity conditions. The fly was planned last October, but then just a few uh, days before, uh, Virgin Galati discovered some problems, structural problems to this spaceship during the pre-flight test, and then they were uh, rescheduling the flight to this October, November. So we really look forward to fly this mission. And uh, but why the Italian force is looking at that? Because we know we need to acquire experience and knowledge on this kind of flight, because Today, we are only experiment, experimental uh, flights, but tomorrow we can imagine that we will have assets, also military assets, flying at uh, around 100 kilometers high, so the Italian force will need to acquire this, this capability. Let's see if the, I don't know if the link is working, I hope. I will show you just the movie, the short video about Virgin Galati launch. And I'll try to comment. Great. Two, one, release, release, release. Fire. Fire. Let's see if we can see. Move it. Okay. Three, two, one, release, release, release. Fire. Fire. I see my computer, but it's not showing the, uh, the, in the monitor. Okay, let's back to the presentation in case we'll uh, present the brief, the video later. Riesco a far vedere il, il video. Prima si vedeva stamattina, adesso non so perché non si riesce a vedere. Siamo qua. 3, 2, 1, release, release, release. Fire, fire! Three, two, one, release, release, release. Fire, fire. Actually, the, the spaceship is uh, underneath uh, a carrier that fly up to, that is this one, up, fly up to 45,000 feet, then release the spaceship. Bar, uh, the, the engine is uh, light up. The spaceship is accelerating Mach 3, is rising up, pitching up to up till 90 degrees, and then it's going to the space, toward the space. Uh, this flight was reaching 96 kilometers. At the same moment that the, the engine is uh, burning out, and then ballistically, the spaceship is reaching the apogee. It was uh, in this mission, 96 kilometers. Then the spaceship will change configuration just to permit to, to the passengers to better see the, the Earth, but also to prepare for the coming back on the Earth. Now, at the moment, you see the fins that are changing configuration. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. In this, in this, in this way, the, uh, you can see the windows, the circular windows, they can better look at the Earth. And then the spaceship is preparing to go back ballistically to the Earth, is re-entering toward the Earth. The, uh, hey, welcome to Space Scotland. <laughs> Congrats to you. Welcome to the club, astronaut. <laughs> Thanks, Space. I like, right. I like this club. Actually, then the spaceship is uh, going back, the thermal uh, and the thermal shield is the underneath. Then, when the spaceship reach uh, roughly 20 kilometers, is a, is a changing configuration again. Is landing like an aircraft without engine, so like the the shuttle recovery. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next topic. Next program that we are following up, 
as a edge force is the air launch. I'm sorry. So nowadays, the militarization of systems allows to, for smaller and smaller satellites. Furthermore, having the ability to launch a mini or micro satellite to quickly replace a failed, a failed or a broken space service is very important for the space resiliency. So having a, an access, a large body aircraft able to launch from the air a rocket that is reaching the space, bringing a micro satellite is uh, considered by the nation very important. For this reason, uh, the Italian force in cooperation with the SNR is developing uh, this kind of project. It's very similar to Virgin Orbit project. Virgin Orbit is a company that built a Boeing 76, 747, bringing a rocket under the wing. And uh, in this way, we can uh, reach uh, uh, reactive launch capability independent from a ground uh, base uh, launch site. And also we can uh, react in a short time to replace uh, a service lost. Let's see now the last program, Stratospheric Platforms. This is also an, another important program for the Air Force. Imagine that having a system capable of operating at the atmosphere above the uh, 20 kilometers altitude will allow to have a platform with a high persistence, persistency and having services like satellite services, but at a very lower, lower cost. This kind of platform you can use uh, to, as a sensor, so you can uh, fly that uh, device, uh, is uh, independent from the weather because it's above the weather and can be permanently stationed somewhere to uh, use uh, the payloads. The, but it's very uh, flexible because if you have any problem or you, have, you need to change the payload, you can just retry free the, the platform, change the payload and then use again. As you know, satellites is possible. When you launch a satellite, it's there. You cannot just recover or it's very difficult to make maintenance in flight. So we are following this program and also with the CNR, this is a collaboration, and we'll try to fly a demonstrator by the end of the year. Actually, the demonstrator is, uh, the concept is an hybrid concept. So the platform will fly as a, as a balloon, so like a lighter than hair, then the outside pressure is uh, decreasing by the altitude, the internal pressure will increase, and the shape will change of the platform of the system and will acquire uh, an aerodynamic, aerodynamic uh, shape, so able to fly with the electrical engines and the solar powers. Then, when uh, you need to retry the platform, you just fly back, fly throughout to the ground and uh, use maintenance or change sensors and then fly back again. So, sorry, two more. Conclusions. As you can see, the very rapid technology evolution in the last century, very, very high speed. For us, for the Air Force, are, uh, all these changes and technology evolution are uh, strategic because we have to keep up with the technology to defend our skies. And so for this reason, uh, we uh, develop these programs to uh, really uh, match the future. And another important point for us was the increased cooperation with the academic world, but also with the industrial counterpart. So this is a, was the last slide, and uh, I thank you for the attention. And if you have any question, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, Galgani. Very interesting. I think that uh, after this presentation regarding the, the Italian Air Force uh, plans for the space, I think that there will be some a lot of questions maybe from the Navy cadets. No, wrong. Okay, Pasquale, no, no questions? Okay, we are on time. Uh, next speaker is uh, from the Italian Navy uh, Test uh, Evaluation Center. Uh, the speaker will be Lieutenant Giordano instead of uh, Commander D'Amico, and they will present uh, the mine project, a human factor uh, project, is it?
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Vincenzo Giordano. I'm here on behalf of Commander D'Amico, a sensing regards, but is currently operating one of the test campaign I will discuss later on. So thanks for hosting us. Um, I'm a flight test engineer at the Naval Test and Evaluation Center in uh, Sarzana, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Lieutenant Alcibiade, he's a medical doctor, and he will explain more in detail the project mine in the last part of the presentation. Quick agenda of what uh, I, we will discuss today. So we will discuss who we are, what our main task and function, our core business, that is the dynamic interface and the ship helicopter operating limitation, or show as we call them, and then a project for the future that is the project mine. So first of all, who we are? Uh, the Naval Test and Evaluation Center or Centro Sperimentale Aeromaritimo is located in Sarzana, even if it depends on from the Navy General Staff. Uh, we are the operational and technical branch of the Navy General Staff for concern the naval aviation. And we are located in Sarzana, so we can be closer to the fleet and the operational needs of the operational squadrons. Uh, our main task and function are related to everything that's new in the fleet for what concerns the naval aviation. So few feet uh, AGL compared to what we've discussed uh, in the last presentations. But nevertheless, uh, we explore what are the capabilities of our helicopters and systems. We develop the operational requirement, we test them, and we give all our expertise to the fleet uh, in order to integrate the aircraft and sensor in the fleet. We give support for the electric, um, electronic warfare, but our core business is what we call the shoal and the dynamic interface interface testing that I will discuss more in detail. So what do we mean with the dynamic interface and show? Uh, it's a process that we can summarize in three phases. Uh, the first phase is just ground. So we try to analyze all what we can on the helicopter and the environment it's going to operate on. The second phase is a flight activity that involves only the helicopter and uh, we try to investigate what can interfere from the helicopter with the ship. And the last phase that is the most expensive one is the sea trials. So we try to perform as many tests as we can in the phase one and two in order to minimize the impact of phase three. So um, from the method point of view, uh, there is a, lot of, a bunch of ground activity to be performed beforehand. So we analyze the uh, inter interoperability between the helicopter and the flight deck. We prepare a test plan and we perform a mechanical characterization of the aircraft and then we go in flight. The first part will be some low airspeed testing and then we go in uh, sea trials. I go slightly more in detail in the next slides. So from a compatibility what, uh, point of view, what do we mean? We mean a geometrical, structural, electromagnetic and an analysis on the field of view from the pilot side. Um, some of them may sound trivial, but they're actually not. I give you some example on that. So the first part is the geometrical compatibility. Uh, basically, we perform some uh, geometrical analysis if the single like, helicopter fits on board the flight deck with all the safety requirements that are needed. Every class of ship is different from another, so we perform obviously this cross-check between every helicopter and every class of ship and new class of ship. We give our contribution before and in the development of new ships in order to be sure that they will be compliant with the ship on operation for the helicopter. Then we perform a structural analysis, uh, making sure that the flight deck is strong enough to um, operate with the helicopter. So the footprint from the landing gear and in all the loading condition and the sea state condition, obviously. So we measure the acceleration on the flight deck and so on in order to provide also the manufacturer of the ship what are the expected loads on the flight deck. We perform some electromagnetic compatibility analysis. Uh, so here the ship and the helicopter are considered both a killer and a victim. So the result of this kind of analysis um, 
might be a reduction of the power of some blanking motors of some of the transmitters in order to be sure that the helicopter does not interfere with the ship and vice versa. So it happens even if naval helicopters are designed to operate in a critical and well intensive electromagnetic environment, but in some cases with old ships it may be required to perform some uh, uh, power reduction for the emitters. And uh, from a field point, um, field of view point, uh, well, point of view, uh, this is an analysis that we performed before operating the SH-90 on board the Cavour on the forward part on the starboard side of the ship. So here we saw that uh, there were no reference and uh, no visual cues for the pilot to be precise in the landing. So beforehand, we understood that we needed a stick. You may see a yellow pole in the bottom left image. That was a mitigation in order to provide the pilot some visual cue to be centered with respect to the landing spot. Afterwards, obviously, we verified if this assumption were correct and we perform, while we performed the sea trials. Uh, after this analysis, we prepare our test plan. Um, as test pilots and flight test engineers, we measure, well, we define what we need to, me to measure, the goals, the rejection criteria, and a big stress on this part is uh, on the safety aspect, so the knock it off criteria and the hazard analysis and mitigation to be sure that we don't damage the machine, obviously, and we come back safely home. And the last part on ground is the mechanical characterization. It's a measure of the excursion of the controls and the actuators of the helicopter. This part uh, is extremely important uh, on an helicopter like the NH-90, that is a full fly-by-wire, where there is no a linear link between the controls and the position of the actuators. So we try to characterize uh, how much margin do we have uh, in each condition before, limiting, before reaching the limits of the helicopter itself. Then we go in flight, finally. And this first part is uh, with the helicopter alone. So we perform what we call a trim flight control position. That is a characterization at a lower speed with different relative winds uh, in terms of uh, direction and magnitude to uh, see how the helicopter behaves with a different wind condition in clean air. So there is no interaction with the environment whatsoever here. It's just the helicopter and the relative wind. Once we define this candidate fly envelope, we test the boundaries of this, uh, of this envelope uh, on board the ship. Finally, we go at sea. At sea trials, uh, well, these are some pictures of the campaign on the, on the Cavour. And we use at this stage uh, the evaluation from an objective point of view and from the pilot point of view in order to understand if every test point is uh, achievable from uh, the average fleet pilot and not the uh, super trained, uh, let's say, test pilot. Yeah, uh, if I like here, I will try to show you a quick example of what may happen. I'm not, so I will describe. Well, the, this was a, a campaign done well, um, performing multiple landings uh, with the same direction of the wind. So we tried to analyze different methods uh, and we saw that in order to minimize uh, what was the uh, duration of the test campaign, we can perform a low speed passage on the side of the ship in order to measure the, well, measure and evaluate the turbulence on that side of the ship uh, for uh, every wind condition, and then we perform the multiple landings in all the spots for this uh, for this carrier. This is the Cavour. It has a six uh, spot, six plus one uh, spots for helicopter, and this helped us in order to minimize the the sea trial campaign. So after we perform many. Uh, landings and takeoff, uh, we have to evaluate if every test point is. Uh, flyable or not for the average fleet pilot. Uh, and in order to accept or reject every test point, uh, we, um, we use objective criteria and pilot evaluation. Uh, for the objective criteria, we use, well, the data from the helicopter. So 
Available power, residual margin on torque, controls and actuators, the attitude and so on. While the pilot evaluation is related to the mental workload and the spare capacity and the visual cues. For the objective part, uh, it's uh, the easiest one because we have instruments to tell us exactly what's going on on the helicopter. This is the system that we developed that is called the SARAD, that it's a data acquisition and recording analysis system that is composed by a, a section that is on board the helicopter, that is the one on the top left part, and uh, that reads from uh, MIL uh, 1553 Bravo bus and 1949. And then there is another station that is the one on the bottom right part that is on board the ship. Uh, that receive data via telemetry, so via RF from the helicopter, and merges this data with what we read on board the ship. So, deck motion, relative wind on the flight deck, and so on. Uh, because it also utilizes some, uh, well, uh, anemometer, uh, well, reading and uh, inertial platform as well. Once we have all these data, we can have a pretty clear picture from the objective point of view of what's going on on the helicopter and the ship. This is a picture of what was going on. Uh, so in this view, we have uh, many more data of what's going on inside the helicopter. So for example, you can see from this screen here, we have these boundaries that are yellow and red and the parameters we're measuring so I, sitting in the back, I can call and knock it off in case we are reaching some of the limits. Um, and don't overload the pilot with um, many data in the, in the front. For what concerns instead the pilot's evaluation, that's a trickier one because uh, as today we use what we call the DIPES scale, that is a sequence of questions that ask the pilot if the single task is achievable, if it's achievable from the average fleet pilot and with level of uh, residual margin in spare capacity. So it's a scale one to five, where one is an extremely easy task to perform and five is not reachable. So this was a way, and it's uh, right now the, uh, well, methodology used worldwide in order to evaluate if uh, uh, from a pilot, pilot point of view, the, the workload is uh, uh, decent or not for, for the single test point. Uh, we merge this kind of information from the pilot with the objective data, and at the end, uh, this is the kind of output we, we obtain. So from this data plus the pilot's uh, indication, we have a, an envelope that is safe to operate with in regards of different weight condition, sea state, day or night, and whatsoever, and that envelope is an envelope of relative wind. So in this case, you can see there is a, uh, a part in the bottom part with a tailwind that is still safe to perform a landing. So our goal is to make this envelope as big as we can, so the ship does not need to maneuver to obtain the good wind for the, for the helicopter. Obviously, uh, this kind of uh, envelope has to be uh, as wide as we can in order to perform uh, well good operational uh, capabilities, but as small as we can in order to be sure that the average fleet pilot can uh, obtain the same uh, results. For the future, we're trying to make even more objective the pilot's point of view with the project uh, miner that my colleague is going to expose to you. Thanks. Thank you, Vincenzo. Yes, it works. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Alessandro Cibiede. I'm a medical doctor and uh, and a flight sergeant. I qualified as flight sergeant in NAS Pensacola back in 2019. And uh, actually, I'm a resident in New York Psychiatry Rome, and I work within the Office for Space and Technological Innovation of the Italian Navy as responsible of some of the research projects we are were related to the human factors, neuroscience, and more broadly, the biotechnology sector. So um, today I'm here to describe a project that we are conducting together with the CSA, the Centro Experimentale Renovale in Luni, which is called the Project MIND. MIND is an acronym that stands for MIND in the Extremes. That's because we are 
what we are we aim to do is to get an objective overall insights of the cognitive performances of specialized operators such as aviators through uh, using uh, innovative technologies such as uh, wearable EEG band ends that what I'm going to talk about to describe later. So the my research protocol basically is a partly uh, already uh, described aims to identify electroencephalographic indicators of uh, resulting to the exposure of an operator to extreme demanding cognitive environments, a condition which is known as mental fatigue. Mental fatigue is what our American colleagues called uh, brain fog. It's basically the results of um, the action of stressor over the human mind that leads to a detriment in the situational awareness and moreover, all the uh, impairment of the cognitive capabilities operator, which is basically one, a very important factor in um, to achieve success in a very demanding context, such as military operations. So um, the main cause of mental fatigue is the lack of sleep, but it's not the only one. Um, basically, we have to imagine our central nervous system, which we called, usually called brain, but it's, that it's something that is kind of broader than the, than the brain only, the brain itself only, is an electrochemical computer which need sometimes to stop and partially reset the condition which is known as sleep. The lack of sleep is the main cause of mental fatigue, but not the only one. There are others, such as the use of drugs, pharmaceutical uh, substances, or uh, even diet, kind of eating uh, uh, parmigiana before <laughs> attending a conference is not really useful for our situational awareness and attention and other factors. So um, we aim basically to monitor that in a non-invasive, in a very effective, objective, and non-invasive way, other than being innovative. And another um, goal of our project is basically to uh, make a comparison between human mental activity in real life and in a very, um, in, a, in, a, in a virtual reality context, basically confronting the result the EG outcomes of pilots while actually flying and while flying the simulator, since flight simulators are the most advanced system for virtual reality actually available. And this is a sector that will become more and more important, not only for military activities, but broader for the human lives in the near future. Just think about the metaverse, it is something that we are starting to talking about very much in the last months that will impact our life in the near future. Well, it does not work properly. <laughs> so basically, the, um, we uh, um, measure the uh, human electrical, brain electrical activity using a wearable EEG headband, which is commercially available. Uh, it, it was designed and it's um, commercialized by a Canadian company, which is called Interaxon. The instrument is called MUSES. Now, the light is not really proper, but as you can see, it fits quite well uh, just below the um, pilot helmet. So it was, it can be worn quite comfortably by the pilot and it could be linked to whatever um, tablet, iPad or computer system by Bluetooth or via USB-C. So um, we basically measure the electrical activity of the uh, pilot before the flight, while executing some psychometric tests, during the actual flight, and right after the flight, while executing other psychometric tests that I will describe later, which are the psychometric tests that we are uh, that we ask them to um, execute, are those which are um, the, we, we test um, cognitive capabilities which are critical to the pilots, namely the digit span, so the capability to retain um, memory short-term memory is basically the, we ask the pilot to repeat the number um, sequences which are shown by um, the computer. These are basically tests that US pilots have performed many times during the selections and, and uh, in other moments. And the mental rotation test, basically um, the capability of the pilot to recognize three-dimensional figures from different point of views. So the, those are very too easy to uh, measure cognitive capabilities, but are what's always very critical for the pilots. Other than that, we test the mindful, the mindfulness capabilities. It's a, quite an innovative thing in neuroscience. Mindfulness is something that we understood from the practice of meditation, 
by Buddhism, Indian, in, in Indian philosophy, basically, is the capability of the subject to be aware in the present moment, to concentrate in the present moment, in something that is very attentional later in the years in the neuroscience sector. And then the Pitts Positive Quality Index, is basically, it tests sleepiness, since I've told you before that the lack of sleep is basically the mainly cause of mental fatigue, especially in the power to, in which we suppose it doesn't use, use drugs or whatever. And, um, and we performed the same two cognitive tests after flights. And after that, we test also um, basically the, the perceived stress for the task that they have performed. The NASA task score the index, the standard index, which is what we use um, in the academia. We don't retest really mindfulness since it's something that doesn't change in a short time. And then the sleepiness, because basically it won't change in, the, um, in that short period of time. So, um, how do we measure mental fatigue by EAGs? Now, there are a variety of strategies to, to do that that have been elaborated for the time. The main one, and then the, the one that I highlighted proposed because it's the one that we are doing, that we are performing, is basically the definition of the ratio between between two exact frequency bands. Basically, our brain works on different frequencies. Basically, it activates in different frequencies depending on, on its uh, basically functioning state. So, it's um, some bands are more expressed during sleep. Some others, while uh, doing condition of high cognitive demanding conditions, other ones are expressed in meditation, for example. And then to measure, to define mental fatigue, basically the best. Now, the easiest and actually the most exact way is to uh, study the, um, uh, the ratio of the expressions of the expression, sorry, of two frequency bands that we are the alpha and the beta one that are the ones that are more expressed during the wake in wake state. Another more sophisticated way is basically to investigate the spectral coherence value. So basically to investigate the coherence values of different bands in different areas, special areas of our brain, basically, uh, namely the beta one. And while it is expressed differently, widely differently by the two brain hemispheres, the left and right one, basically, it's an index of uh, mental fatigue. Basically, the two hemispheres are not very well synchronized as they have to be to perform uh, very effectively. And two even more sophisticated ways are the definition of the brain complexity, basically the brain complexity, the interactions between different brain areas changes, decreases with the, uh, in a fatigue state, in a state of mental fatigue. And um, the measurement of the brain complexity, as the name itself says, uh, it's quite difficult. It's a very sophisticated analysis that is, is done in, with two, applying two mathematical models. This is the fatigue entropy and the complexity of lateral Z. Basically, these two ways are too sophisticated to be implemented with the instrument that we are using, since our headbands is just uh, seven electrodes. So basically, um, so it's not a clinically valuable instrument, since the average EEG for clinical purposes is uh, using 64 channels, 64 electrodes. So we can can perform this kind of analysis with our headbands. But the advantages of being so comfortable to be worn and uh, the possibility to perform the measurement with the headbands, even while actually flying, is something that basically encourages us to use those instruments instead of a more clinically advanced instrument. So why is it so important to measure and monitor fatigue in pilots? So it's very important because those are the data reported by US Navy Naval Safety Center referring to the flight years uh, 2011, 2016, and the flight years more broadly, the flight years 1990, uh, 2011. Basically, as we can see, so the fatigue, the pilot fatigue is the main cause of mishaps or hazards in the first time frames, while it's the second cause of class A mishaps, so the most critical ones, uh, the second leading cause right after spatial disorientation. That's why it's so important to monitor fatigue on pilots. And that's why we are very enthusiastic of this research project. <laughs> Uh, we uh, have already performed eight measurements in a pilot study the 28th of February 2022, so the past 28th of February. And uh, as you can see in the picture, this is the setup. So the operator, that's actually our, the commander of the CSA, um, 
uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, D'Amico, uh, who is performing the psychometric. Uh, no, I don't remember if it's the picture referred to the player post flight psychometric <laughs> testing, like the way we're performing psychometric testing at the computer and uh, um, we're recording the EEG track. Well, the EEG uh, measurements taken while actually performing the flight of the simulator, that's the simulator we are in doing, that is referring to the uh, CH101 helicopters. So we test eight pilots, that the, uh, and that's the demographic table of the subject we have tested. Now, um, I, I can report now the results, the actual results, since we have we are uh, publishing them on a journal, so we can report them before having um, them being published. Now, what are the perspectives of our research? Now, um, the perspective are obviously to expand the number of subjects that we test, to expand the number of platforms in which we perform those tests. Now we are uh, in an interlocution phase with the, uh, basically in, in a number of space medical research laboratory in Dayton Air Force Space Ohio in the United States. Uh, since um, last month in Lisbon, there was a uh, medical maritime committee of the NATO in which we illustrated also this, uh, this research project and uh, it, uh, was quite interested in uh, cooperate to uh, perform the same protocol uh, there in the United States. We are hoping to collaborate with the uh, academic industry world and, um, uh, and we are even planning actually to uh, expand the testing to other uh, specialized operators within the armed forces, namely the um, special forces team. Since we are already coordinating, we had already coordinated the testing, but the uh, situation, the actual situation in Ukraine changed their plans. So we, we wanted to test special forces operator with the EEG advance while performing such demanding tests they are required to do kind of like uh, sniper shooting and uh, other kind of tasks that they are asked to perform. So TSA and uh, in the use it, the Office for Space, we are even space nerds, very space nerds. And that's why we are, uh, our project also aim to solve, to answer some needs uh, coming from the uh, human space flights uh, world. That's why this project is also attention by the uh, Italian and European speech agencies. Why that? Because uh, what I'm showing you in this picture is basically the flight path that the, um, NASA, the American Space Agency, basically um, expect for the journey to Mars. That was the plan right above the right before uh, changing. Uh, uh, targets to, the, to the, going back to the moon. Basically, the, the journey to Mars um, required the um, astronauts to stay in an isolation situation for up to six months just for the going trip. Then another couple of years or 500 days circa on the surface of Mars and another three to six months just to go back to the Earth. Those conditions are um, uh, put the subjects in an extremely situation of isolation and confinement. And we have unearthed analogs, the so-called space analogs, in which we investigate human performances in situation of isolation and confinement similar to the one of space that we find in space, namely Antarctic research stations, such as the, the Concordia one, that is this one, which is operated by the PNRA and EPF, the Italian and French Polar Institutes. And together with the ESA, the European Space Agency, just to study human performances there. And um, basically, we, um, the data that we collect with the MIME projects are complementary to the data that we are collecting with the IRIS project, which is a project we are conducting in Antarctica together with the European Space Agency, in which we perform the same tests that we perform in the MIME project. As you can see by this setting, this is referred to the Winter Over Campaign 2021-2022, um, after this picture, it was taken in Antarctica, in the ESA lab in Antarctica, in which we make the um, crew members performing our uh, psychometric test while uh, recording the EEG track. You can see the band which communicates via Bluetooth with the tablet. That's our experimental setting. So we are testing those, uh, the same psychometric capabilities, mental rotation task, memory span, etc., which are critical for pilots and astronauts too. On this subject, timely every month during the one year that they are required to spend in isolation in Antarctica, 
just to define the detrimental trend caused by isolation, right? by extreme isolation of operators. So we aim to measure how isolation leads to, to quantify the detriment in human cognitive capabilities due to isolation. And with the MIME project, in which we compare the human performances in, during high demanding tasks in reality and virtual reality, we aim to define how much we can compensate the detriment using virtual reality training. Why? Because after six months in space, in outer space, those people will, will be asked to perform one of the most demanding tasks ever asked to a human being, such as landing on Mars, while being at millions of kilometers at, uh, far from Earth with the, up to 50 minutes of communication delay. So they will be lonely there, and they, that will be a one-shot goal. So we, train, uh, we aim to define how much and uh, we can retain the skills needed to landing on Mars on those operators while in isolation thanks to virtual reality. Basically, I finished my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Giordano. Thank you also for Lieutenant Alcibiade. I'm sorry if I forgot to introduce you at the beginning of the presentation. And any questions? I hope that uh, the final results that you will present also to the Italian Air Force, the Flight yes. Safety Directorate, because I think it's very, very interesting. And uh, we need to exchange uh, the experience from the helicopters, pilots, uh, among the Italian Air Force and also the Italian Army. Oh, absolutely. Uh, sorry. And, uh, it's we, a pity we, that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grandi today is not here because he fell in the COVID. I know, uh, I know him personally. And, uh, Are you know him? Yes, I know him personally. And um, if the results will be published in, on time, which is not that uh, normal, since uh, always the journal have some <laughs> thing to appoint to be corrected, we have to present them to the next um, IMAS conference that will be held in Reggio Calabria from the uh, Italian Society for Space Medicine, which is led by... Yeah, I think that in the future, maybe in two years, you have to uh, to prepare a new project uh, with a new um, some other pilots because oh, sorry. maybe the age uh, generation will change. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, and the mood. No, too. that's an hypothesis since uh, um, the very the younger generations are more exposed to virtual reality since the very yeah. basically since they were born. <laughs> I can see that it with my niece actually since they are exposed to video games, etc. Et and uh, that's a very interesting question and it's something that. I personally intend to investigate because it's a real hypothesis. Younger generation are exposed to virtual reality since. Uh, Great. That's different from the older generation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, if there aren't uh, questions, uh, we have a break, a coffee break. Uh, we'll be back at uh, four o'clock uh, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Galliani. He's a director of uh, the Italian uh, Center Meteorology. Meteorology, not metrology and uh, with, uh, with a project, a specific project uh, developed and made inside the, the Italian Air Force. Thank you, see you at four o'clock.